Hello everyone, welcome back to Dan Green Cuts. Today we'll be taking a look at another problem from the USA Math Olympiad 2024. So the general consensus seems to be that this year's USAMO seems to be at least a bit harder than previous years. And problem 2 is a perfect illustration of this. This problem involves quite a deep level thinking and it can get a bit abstract and confusing at times. So without further ado, let us take a look at what this monster combinatorics problem is. So problem 2 is as follows. Let S1 to S100 be finite sets of integers whose intersection is not empty. For each non-empty T subcollection of S1 to S100, the size of the intersection of the sets in T is a multiple of the number of sets in T. What is the least possible number of elements that are in at least 50 sets? Sounds a bit confusing, let's break it down a little bit first. So throughout this proof, I'll be using a table as a visual depiction of uh, set membership. So over here, I have the sets S1 to S100, and over here, I'll have the elements. And if an element belongs to a set, I will just put a 1 in the corresponding entry. Okay, so the first statement is saying that all this set, when you take the intersection of all 100 sets, it will not be empty. There's at least a common element. Let's say uh, A1, then it will be a row of 1s because it belongs to every single set. Okay, next, each time you take some non-empty collection, let's say you take a collection of 98 sets, S1 to S98. Then when you take the intersection, meaning you look at the number of common elements that are in S1 to S98, that number of common elements is a multiple of 98 itself because 98 is the size of your collection. Similarly, as another example, if you look at S51 to S100, that is a collection of 50 sets. The number of common elements is a multiple of 50. Okay, the goal is to find the least possible number of elements that are in at least 50 sets. So the natural thing to do is maybe you want to start off with constructing uh, a possible way to fulfill the requirement of the question while having as little elements in at least 50 sets as possible. And of course, we will not be first bothering ourselves to prove that what we do is uh, if the most efficient solution. We just heuristically think of a way to be efficient. At the end, we will get a number. We will get a construction which gives us a number. Then what we'll do is we'll prove that number is indeed the least possible a number of elements. Okay, so we start off with the construction. So how can we be efficient in fulfilling the requirements of the question? Let's start off from the top. If we look at all 100 sets, well, we need the number of common elements to be a multiple of 100. So the most efficient way is to just include 100 common elements. Of course, if we go step by step, there's no guarantee that taking 100 now leads to the globally most efficient solution. But once again, we are not going to prove the most efficient at this point. We are just going to do a construction that we think is efficient and get an answer. So moving to the next level, if we then look at some collection of 99 sets, let's say S1 to S99. I currently have 100 common elements but I need the number of common elements to be a multiple of 99. So the most efficient way, or rather uh, efficient way for now, is to just use 198 common elements. We add another 98 common elements to this collection of 99 sets. But we have to do this for every collection of 99 sets. So if, for example, if we now look at S1 to S100 except S99, Again, it has 100 common elements. We need to add another 98 common elements that belong to only these 99 sets. And we get 198 uh, common elements. And in doing so, we do not violate the earlier uh, 100 sets having 100 common elements. Okay. 
Now, I'm going to simplify the way I present my table so that I have more space to put more things. So when I put a 100x here, it means there's 100 elements with this uh, pattern of 1 and 0, this pattern of set membership. So as we saw earlier, for each collection of 99 sets, we need 98 common elements that belong to only these 99 sets. And there's 100 choose 99 of these uh, different uh, patterns. Okay. Now let's move on to the next level of 98 sets. Now this currently, if we look at a collection of 98 set, it currently has 2 times 98 plus 100 common elements. Why is this the case? Well, for the 98 sets, you can augment it into a collection of 99 sets in two choose one ways because you look at the two excluded elements and you choose one of them to be the augmenting element. So that's why it's two ways of it being contained in a collection of 99 sets and each of that collection has 98 common elements already. So that explains this first term. And of course, it belongs to uh, the full collection of 100 sets, so it does already have these 100 common elements as well. How do we make this a multiple of 98? Well, well, the most direct way is we need something to balance the 100 to make it a multiple of 98, so we add 96 elements. So 96 plus this already multiple of 98 plus 100 give you a multiple of 98. So uh, specifically for each collection of 98 sets, now we need to put 96 common elements that belong exactly to these 98 sets. Okay, I think you will see the pattern if we do one more. So for collection of 97 sets, same thing. It belongs to a collection of 98 sets in 3 choose 1 way, collection of 99 sets in 3 choose 2 way, and it belongs to the full collection of 100 sets. So this is the number of current uh, common elements. To make this a multiple of 97, the average of 96 and 98 is already 97. So I just need to balance the 100. So I put in 94 new common elements that belong to exactly these 97 sets. Okay, so hopefully by now the, the pattern is clear. And now we can continue this pattern all the way until 51 sets. In fact, you can continue until 50. Uh, and you'll realize that for 50, you only need to add zero new common elements. Okay, so uh, you can prove this pattern rigorously yourself. I'm just going to convert this into symbols now. So for essentially for each k bigger than or equal to 51 or 50 if you like, for each 100 choose k collection of k sets, I'm going to create 2k minus 100 elements that belong exactly to these k sets and none of the other sets. So I'm just essentially describing this table over here in words. And uh, if you follow my chain of reasoning, you can very easily convert this to a proof that this fulfills uh, the requirements of the question. And of course, uh, for k less than 50, we do whatever it takes to fulfill the requirement of the question but we can be inefficient, do whatever we want because it doesn't affect our answer here. Now, what is then the total number of elements in at least 50 sets in this construction? Well, it's just a simple method of summing up over the different case. So for each k, we have 100 choose k collection. Each collection has 2k minus 100 uh, elements, common elements. Okay, and from here, uh, you can be satisfied that this is the answer. If you would like, you can further simplify it using some algebra. So uh, by combinatorial identity that 100, K, 100 choose k is same as 100, choose 100 minus k, you can flip the indices to become from 0 to 49. And even further, you can simplify this to a closed file expression 50 times 100 choose 50. So I'm going to skip the algebra, but one way to show this is you can use induction to show the following uh, identity. There's also a combinatorial proof of this, which I will not bother to cover in this video. So unfortunately, this is actually the easier part of the problem. I think the construction is not that difficult to motivate. The harder part of the problem is to convince yourself that this is indeed the most efficient solution. 
and then come up with a proof of that lower bound. So let us now show the lower bound of 50 times 100 choose 50. Okay, the way we do this is quite slick. What we'll do is we'll continually modify uh, our sets through steps. And for each step, we will keep the number of elements that are in at least 50 sets unchanged. And we'll keep the second statement of the property true. So these multiple shenanigans continue to remain true uh, after each step. But what we are no longer required to be true is that all the elements, uh, all the sets have a common element. In fact, what we'll do is we are going to define the concept of a level to be the maximum k such that there exists a collection of k sets whose intersection is not empty. So at the start, the level is 100 because uh, if you take the there is a common element across all 100 sets. We are going to reduce the level to 99, meaning there's only a common element that is, there's an element that is common to uh, up to 99 sets, but nothing more. Then we reduce the level to 98, to 97, and so on. Eventually, when the level reaches uh, 50, that is where we can make a very important deduction. So let us see what is this actual modification that we are making. So suppose the level currently is at k. This should read k bigger than or equal to 51. My apologies for the typo. Now what is the modification? Well, by definition of level, we can find k sets that have common elements. And by this multiple shenanigan, there needs to be at least k common elements. In fact, a multiple of k number of common elements. Now, uh, for illustration purposes, I'm going to put this in a k by k uh, matrix. But of course, the uh, sets in the collection need not be consecutive, and the elements also need not be consecutive. Okay, what is this modification that I'm talking about? What we'll do is we'll drop a distinct element from each set. So for the first set, we drop some element. For the second set, we drop a different element, and so on. You can visualize this by seeing uh, that we put a zero across one of the diagonals of the matrix. Okay, so how does this modification uh, retain the two properties that we talked about? The first one is the number of elements in at least 50 sets remain unchanged. Obviously, only elements that are reflected here are affected by this operation, but because they are in at least 51 uh, sets, by dropping their membership in one set, they will still be in at least 50 sets. So there is basically no change to this quantity. How about the multiple shenanigans? So the other claim is to show that the second sentence remains true. Now let's take a look at this. So when we drop elements from uh, sets, what are the collection of sets that might be affected? Well, firstly, the collection of sets that are affected can only be sub-collection of the collection of these k sets. What do I mean by this? Well, if we look at a collection, that is not fully contained in the collection of the k sets. Let's say uh, S1 does not belong to the collection of k sets, but it is in uh, another collection. Is it going to be a victim? Is that collection, that new collection, going to be a victim? The answer is no, because if an element were common to S1, blah, 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 blah. The element cannot be among these k elements because these k elements uh, outside of this first collection, they are all zeros. They don't belong to any other set that are not in this collection, the first collection. So these elements over here cannot be common elements to S1 blah blah blah. So the common elements 
to S1 blah, 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 are not affected. Therefore, only collections that are sub collection of this K set are possible victims. Now, obviously, they lost common elements, but if we look at a sub collection that contains J sets, let's say uh, these three sets, how many common elements did they lose? Well, they lose J common elements because only the uh, for each set, meaning each column, only one row will be marked to zero. So this means that J common elements now drop out of that collection of J sets. So if that co sub collection initially has a multiple of J number of common elements, I now lose J, I am still going to have a multiple of j number of common elements. So the divisibility property remains. So this is a bit confusing. Do pause the video if you need to think about it further. This is the part of the video, the part of the solution that is the most abstract. But once we convince ourselves that the second sentence remains true, then it's just a matter of now repeating this operation over and over again. Each time you repeat operation, uh, you lose common elements that belong to K uh, sets. Eventually, you will no longer have collection of K sets with common elements. Then the level would drop from K. Maybe it becomes K minus one. Maybe that not. Maybe you might even skip past K minus one. But eventually. Uh, you can repeat this until the level first hits 50 or below. Then, what we see is that if an element is common to 50 sets, it only belongs to exactly those 50 sets. That's the definition of level. And from here, we can very quickly see that the number of elements that are in at least 50 sets, remember this number, has been invariant throughout our entire process. But now we can finally bound it because we know that there's 100 choose 50 collection of 50 sets. Each of them still satisfy these multiple shenanigans. So it must be at least 50. So this is uh, the conclusion of the proof of the lower bound. It looks a bit uh, abstract and pulled out of the thin air, but this is what makes this problem essentially quite more difficult than your standard combinatorics problem. So what do you think of this problem too from the USA MO2024? Perhaps you find the construction uh, a bit intuitive, but the proof of the lower bound is what tripped most people up. So stay tuned to the channel for more math videos, comment in the section below what you think, and see you soon.